Hello everyone, um, today in today's video we're going to be doing a full playthrough of Alone Against the Flames. This is a solo adventure from Chaosium for Call of Cthulhu 7th edition. You can get the PDF free from the Chaosium website or you can buy the physical version as part of the starter set. From this point on there will be spoilers, so please stop watching here if you haven't already played through the game at least once. Uh, you'll ruin at least some of the choices for yourself. Otherwise, let's get stuck in. So, let's get started with Alone Against the Flames. So, here I have the PDF open. I also have uh, the starter set rules, the introductory rules, which you might need from time to time. And I have a blank character sheet here, which can be downloaded from the Call of Cthulhu, I'm sorry, the Chaosium website. Um, there's a lot to look at here. Ignore everything. This is one of the best things about the uh, Alone Against the Flames solo adventure, is that it walks you through everything. So you can start with no understanding of the rules, just get going. It will tell you everything as needed. So let's get started. So you start on entry one. The sun is high in the sky, a merciless ball of heat. You feel scorched by the time you reach the bus halt in front of Osborne's drugstore. It's a relief to put down your heavy cases and take off your hat for a moment. You fan your face. It has been a long summer here in your hometown, and yet a curiously empty one. You look across the street at the grubby butcher's shop, the grocer's with its faded awning, and the shabby tobacconist. Mistrustful faces glare at you as they pass, eyeing your clothes and luggage. It was your parents' choice to live here, not yours. You were happy down south as a child, among Providence's white-walled houses and leafy churchyards. Perhaps this new job in Arkham will supply the change you need. Yet everybody you know in the world lives here. You know nobody in Arkham, not one soul. You ask yourself one last time if you are doing the right thing. The answer is here. None of your supposed friends have come to see you off. You are alone. Whatever challenges lie in Arkham, it will be a new life, and a brave one. A small grey motor coach approaches and rattles to a stop. You put your hat back on your uh, I'm sorry, you put your hat back on and pick up your cases. Go to two sixty three. So no choice here, let's go to two sixty three. Two young men with sullen expressions alight from the coach. One looks you up and down before heading away. The driver also steps down, glancing at you before crossing the road to visit the tobacconist. When he returns, he is rolling a cigarette between his yellowed fingers. He gives it a final twist and examines you as he reaches for his matchbox. He is a thin man in his fifties, dressed in a stained shirt with the bus company emblem. Yet his eyes are sharp in their dark sockets. Where to? You show him your ticket for Ossipi. From there you will connect to Rochester and Portsmouth, before the coastal line to Newburyport, and finally Arkham. You should be able to afford a rail ticket for at least some of the way. Otherwise, this will be the first of many long bus trips. Mm-hmm. The driver scratches the match and lights his cigarette. The end flares as he takes a draw. Then he exhales and gestures to the back of the coach. Luggage racks up there. Look at your investigator sheets. At the top you have spaces for eight characteristics. Strength, constitution, power, dexterity, appearance, size, intelligence, and education. Allocate the following values among them, writing them in the large square beside each. So 40, 50, 50, 50, 60, 60, 70, and 80. If you would like more information about what these characteristics mean, read page, read page 7 of book 2. Um, so yeah, you can absolutely do that here. Is this page seven? Yes. Ah, yeah, so it gives you a quick overview. You don't need to know that. Uh, just a general idea. The only one that's maybe a little bit confusing. Strength is strength. Constitution is constitution. Dexterity. Uh, appearance is how... Uh, not only how attractive you are, but also how well-dressed you are. Size is your height and your width as well. 
um, intelligence is your intelligence, education, education. The only one is power, you might not know, is your willpower. A combination of force of will, spirit, and mental stability. So, let's see. Oh, oh yeah, I don't have a name yet. That's fine. It'll come up later. Um, so, let's start at the top. What do I want to be my best one? Um, let's make me nice and dexterous. I will also uh, be relatively strong. Um, and I want to be kind of intelligent as well. 60. Now, I think I have... How many? Uh, one, two, three. Ah, one more 60 and another 50. Um, so, with a mustache like that, I think my appearance has to be a 60. Um, I will be... I'm going to be small, though. going to be small. And the rest, I'll just fill in with 50s. And you can see that a number of other numbers filled in there as well. Don't worry about that. Generally, higher number is better, and this, you can see, is half and one-fifth. Don't worry about that for now. It will explain it as it comes up as necessary. So I've just put them in. Feel free to put them in randomly. Okay, once you've done that, go to eight. The driver smokes and watches as you drag your cases to the back of the motor coach. The rack is set inconveniently high on the vehicle. You get a grip on, your, on the heavier case. If your size is 40, which it is, go to 23. If your size is higher than this, go to 38. So obviously if you're taller and bigger, uh, it's easier to put the luggage up on the rack. Uh, I'm tiny, so let's see what happens. 23. You struggle for a few seconds before the driver comes up beside you and lends a hand, still puffing on a cigarette. Heavy bags for a small one, he remarks. You judge it best to respond with a simple thanks. So, go to 233. Three. The driver flicks his cigarette into the gutter and steps into the motor coach. Its engine coughs into life. You board, grateful that you will be the only passenger for the initial part of your trip, at least. With mixed emotions, you watch from uh, the window as the tired avenues of your old home slip behind you, receding into the distance. For a few minutes, you can still see the church spire over the brow of a low hill. Then, the road dips, and it, too, is gone. Arkham is your new home. You will travel there and make a new start. You will see two smaller boxes to the right of each characteristic value. Have each value rounding down and write the result in the upper right box. Also, divide each value by five, again rounding down, and write the result in the lower right box. We'll use these numbers later. If you're using the interactive PDF version, uh, the sheet does all of it for you. In the strip below, you'll see tracks that record sanity and magic points. Beginning sanity is equal to your original power, and beginning magic points are the same as the value you've just assigned for the power divided by five. So as I mentioned, the auto calc sheet has filled these in here, um, and including my sanity. Oh, it didn't do my sanity. But my sanity is equal to my starting power, which is only 50. Uh, maybe I should have thought about that more. That's fine. Um, hit points is automatically calculated based on your strength and constitution, I believe. Um, and magic points. Um, don't worry too much about this. Also, I believe at the very end of the... Yes! At the end of the um, introductory rules, there is this very useful quick reference sheet if you don't want to do any mathematics. Um, this becomes more useful when you're creating original characters um, using different values, but you can ignore that for now. But say, for example, if your um, one of your stats is 70, then the half value will be 35 and the one fifth value will be 14. Okay. But we've already done that using the autocalc sheet. Okay, so next one. 134. The coach putters throughout, uh, through the countryside. At first, the interior is stifling, and your stomach lurches with every bend in the road. However, the driver opens his window, and by switching seats, you find a spot where the breeze hits your face. You soon relax into the journey, observing the quaint little hamlets that the coach serves. A heavy-set woman boards at one settlement and gives you a polite nod. She gets off at the next one. The road rises a little, passing cornfields and orchards. 
The leaves are turning, and the trees are alive with glorious reds and golds. You have just begun to doze when the driver takes a tight bend at speed. Add size and con together, then divide the total by 10, rounding down. Ah, here's the calculation. This is the starting value for your hit points. Mark it on your investigator sheet. So that's already done. Um, so my size and my constitution is 90, divided by 10 is 9 hit points. Your current total may drop, but it is unlikely to exceed the starting value. You also have a luck score. Roll three six-sided dice. We call this 3d6. Multiply your 3d6 roll result by 5 to get your beginning luck score and mark it on your investigator sheet. Okay, so for this I'm using a dice roller. Uh, I do have the starter set dice here, uh, but just so it's easier for you to see, I will use an online dice roller. Uh, it couldn't be easier if you don't have it. Just go to Google and search dice roller or roll dice, and this will come up. Actually, it will come up looking like this. 1d6 will be there. So what we want to do is we want to have 3d6. So I'll click one more and one more. So now I have 3d6. And always I put the dice up and then roll. Also, this is a bad score. so. <laughs> but it's no harm having bad scores, especially in Call of Cthulhu. 11. Not that bad. Okay. Um, multiply your 3d6 roll. Uh, result by 5 to get your beginning luck score and mark it on your investigator sheet. So, uh, I had 11, multiplied by 5 is, um, I should know that, 55. So, 55. And I'll mark that as my uh, starting and also my current. Uh, the starting, it's good to keep track of that. And so I'll do the same with sanity. And hit points. And magic points. But these will obviously change. Current will change. Now you, uh, so, uh, you have just begun to doze when the driver takes a tight bend at speed. Now you must make a roll against your dex. Roll 1d100. This means rolling two 10-sided dice and using one value for the 10s and one value for the units. Um, unless you use the special dice here. So I'll show you actually both versions here. Um, so using this, uh, if you click on the dice, they will disappear. And now what I want to do is to use two 10-sided dice. And I will use the first number as a 10s. So in this case, it would be 32. Um, this is the 10s and this is the units. So let's roll there. See, what do I do? 56. So I got a 56 and my dexterity, I'm pretty sure, is 70. Ah, uh, 80, even better. So I managed to score under my dexterity score. So that is a pass. Um, it can be a little bit confusing because uh, in other RPGs, especially Dungeons & Dragons, you want to score over that. In this case, because it's a D100 system, um, 80 means you're kind of like 80% good at something. So anything below that means you passed it. And anything over that means that you failed it. Um, once you get used to it, it actually makes a lot of sense, I think. So 80. Um, so that's one of the ways to do it. The other way to do it is to use the... Um, there is also a tens dice. So in the Call of Cthulhu starter set, it actually comes with 3d10. So I hope you can see this okay. This is a 10-sided dice with numbers... 1 to 10, well, 0 to 9, but 1 to 10. Um, this is a 10-sided dice with numbers 10 to 100, or 0, 0 to 90. Um, so in this case, this is automatically working as your 10s dice. And they also give you another one, uh, because sometimes you will roll with, um, not advantage or disadvantage, but something similar to that. Ignore that for the moment anyway. So just roll dice like that, and it will tell you here. Uh, if you rolled equal to your dex or less, which I did, um, you passed. If you rolled greater than your dex, you failed the roll. Um, when you're playing this game, don't worry about failing a roll. It actually makes the story more interesting. Um, not succeeding all the time. And it doesn't mean you're going to fail the entire thing. Um, 
the goal of this is not even to win, is to have an interesting experience. Uh, you may Oh, they say the exact same thing. You may be tempted to skip such roles and simply pretend you always pass, but Call of Cthulhu is a game of mystery and horror. The terrible disasters that can befall your character are part of the fun. You will not necessarily have more fun if you pass every roll than you would have if you failed. I actually think you'll have more fun if you failed sometimes. Uh, if you pass the next roll, which I did, 261. So 261, here it is. A desperate yell awakens you. You feel yourself slide from the seat as the driver spins the wheel and the motor coach plunges off the road. You grab hold of the seat in front, just in time to prevent a painful fall. The coach stops with a thump. Now you see what has happened. A Fordson tractor has stopped in the road, and your driver has had to swerve to avoid the steel obstacle. He leaps from the seat into the road, unleashing a string of curses at the farmer. You take a moment to catch your breath. Perhaps you should offer assistance, but the driver has already returned. He backs the coach up a little and threads it around the tractor, glaring at the farmer. Go to 71. You resume your journey. The driver takes the curves with more caution than before. He glances over his shoulder at you a couple of times. Sorry about that, he says. That fellow was dumber than a hog. I'm Silas. What's your name? The accident was at least as much Silas's fault as the farmer's, but it doesn't seem shrewd to antagonize a man while he is driving you through the middle of nowhere. Make up a name for your character and record it on your investigator sheet. You may add your age for the purpose. Ah, you may add your age for the purposes of this adventure. Your character should probably be aged between twenty-three and thirty-six. So let's think of a an age. Uh, let's just go with thirty. That's nice and easy. Um, and this guy looks like a Phileas. Um, I can't. I can't go with Phileas Fog. I can't. Uh, Phileas Jew. That's terrible. Anyway, um, oh, it's still here. The coach turns on, narrow, on a narrower road, which weaves uphill through woodlands. Silas becomes chatty. Going to Arkham, eh? Can't say I've ever heard much of the place. Went to Boston once. Didn't like it. Too much hustle and bustle. You got family there? A special someone waiting? The afternoon is wearing on. You see no harm in confiding in Silas about your new life. A job, eh? What's your line? Choose an occupation for your character from the following options. If you are an antiquarian, go to 102, someone who deals with antiques, um, if and including old books as well. If you are a doctor of medicine, go to 226. If you are a journalist, go to 239. If you are a private investigator, go to 249. And if you are a professor, go to 265. I think the first time I did this, I think I was a journalist. So this time I'm going to be a professor. So I'll just um, pop it in here as well. Professor. Great. Um, two, six, five. You explain you're joining the faculty at the renowned Miskatonic University. It's only a junior position with teaching and tutoring duties, but the institution is well regarded. Who knows where the appointment might lead? A symposium? A visiting lectureship? Even one of its world-spanning expeditions? Mmm. Silas wrinkles his nose. I had enough of book learning when I was a young'un. Still, I suppose it's well enough for those who likes it. Your credit rating is 30. Okay, so now we're going to look at our skills here. So there's so many skills. Do not be overwhelmed by this. It's actually very easy. So I'll go down and I'll find my credit rating one. I'll put in 30. Boom. And it does the automatic calculation here as well. So credit rating is kind of how much money you have or how much wealth you are perceived to have. Uh, your occupation skills are library use, other language, I get to choose one, own language, and psychology. You may also pick four other skills, not Cthulhu Mythos, as the relevant uh, academic or personal specialities. Allocate the following values among these occupation skills, writing them in the large square beside each. 70, 60, 60, 50, 50, 50, 40, 40. Ignoring any starting values mentioned on this starter sheet. So you can see here, for example, in accounting, 
it says you have a base value of 5%. That means that uh, even if you don't have this skill, anyone can try it uh, to do some accounting check and they have a 5% chance of succeeding. Uh, similarly, for first aid, you have a 30% chance of succeeding. Um, you can see dodge here is half of your dexterity. So if I want to, um, my dodge will just remain at 40, but I could also increase that if I wanted. Um, I'm kind of fine with that. Um, so I'll definitely have library use, which I think is a good one here. So I'm going to put in 70. Remember, we ignore the starting value of 20. So I'm just going to pop in 70 there. Um, 60, 60, 50, 50. Um, psychology. Yeah, psychology is nice. Let's put in psychology at a 60. Um, now, own la language. Own is based on your education. Um, which is 50. <laughs> wow, maybe I shouldn't be a professor. It's fine. Um, and another language. Let's say, at the time, let's say Latin. I think uh, Lovecraft li liked Latin. And English. Oops, sorry. Um, so uh, here I have a skill of, do I have two 60s? Yes. Um, your ability in your own language, even if it's um, 60, this doesn't mean that I'm equally as fluent in Latin as I am in English. Um, but ign ignore that anyway. Um, so I've got a 70, two 60s and a 50. I've got two more 50s and two 40s. And I can choose anything as academic or personal specialities. So let's say I'm also into uh, climbing. Oh, that's charm. Hmm, I, am I charming? Yes, yes I am. <laughs> I am charming, so let's pop that in. My climbing is okay. Um, fast talk. Let's say I'm actually, despite my size, I have a good strength, so I'm good at brawling. I think I have one more 50 left. And last one, I will pop in. Stealth. Stealth is always a nice one to have as well. So let's just check. I should have nine things checked here, including credit rating. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Perfect. So again, just fill them in. Don't worry too much about them. Um, if you need information about some of them, you can check them in the rules, but just see what ones do you think uh, sound good. So uh, next check, uh, one, two, eight. You realize silence hasn't made a stop since the incident with the tractor. The motor coach winds its way uphill. However, your thoughts are interrupted as the road crests a ridge and you are treated to a magnificent view of the vista below. A creek snares through the valley, breaking the rich autumn palette of the tree line. In the distance, the white mountains rise into hazy cloud. There is no settlement, not even a cabin, as far as the eye can see. Birds drift through the treetops, and you can just make out what might be two white-tailed deer lingering by the water. Perhaps you are making a mistake by moving to the city. Could you survive on your own in this lush wilderness? You have a base ability in most skills, listed in brackets after the skill name um, on the investigator sheet. For instance, you have 20% in climb and a base dodge equal to half of your dexterity. Choose four skills which are not your occupation skills. So anything that I've already chosen, I can't choose it again. Um, uh, these are your personal interest skills. Boost each of these by 20 points. So when, when I put in, um, so psychology would be related to work. That's fine. Stealth could also be related to work. Um, fighting. Yeah, sometimes maybe I got into fights at work. That's fine. Uh, so I'm going to choose four more skills to boost them by 20. Um, I'm going to just, these are my personal skills. Um, I'm going to say that maybe I ran track and field and my jumping is not so bad. I practice a little bit of close-up magic. So my sleight of hand is okay. Two more. Um, so dodge is half dex, which is 40. So I'm actually going to bring that up to a 60 now. 
And do I have any experience with guns? Nah. Um, I'm not intimidating. Am I intimidating? Let's do a little bit of a cult as well. Okay. So those are my skills. And that's pretty much as much as you're going to get. You've got your uh, credit rating plus eight occupation skills and then four uh, personal interest skills. At this point, you may like to calculate your half and fifth. That's fine. Um, it's already done for us. So 144. The motor coach rattles on through the hills and Silas lapses into silence. Ooh, nice picture. Um, the sky darkens behind you. Pinks tinting the clouds as the sun descends. Finally, a welcome sight comes into view. A settlement on the crest of a hill. This doesn't look like the picture you've seen of Ossipi. Ossipi. But perhaps you can persuade Silas to stop when you stretch your leg, while you stretch your legs. Minutes later, a harsh stuttering from the engine interrupts your reverie. Silas frowns and rattles the gear stick. The motor coach falters in its ascent. Silas utters a curse uh, you don't recognize and grinds his teeth, struggling at the wheel. You seem to inch up the hill until you reach the first buildings, low dwellings constructed from a rough red stone. Silas wrestles the coach into a small bay off the road. He scrambles from the seat and makes for the engine compartment. You must now choose to make a roll against Drive Auto or Psychology. If you choose Drive Auto, you need to roll equal to or less than the skill value. If you choose Psychology, you'll need a hard success. So if so, my skill in Drive Auto is 20%. So I have to roll 20 or lower to succeed in this. Um. If I want to do psychology, my skill is 60, but I need a hard success. Hard success means getting less than half of the value. So I need to roll under a 30 here. Um, ah, so a hard success. This is a roll equal to or less than half the skill value, the number in the uh, upper right box. You may attempt only one skill roll. So let's have a quick look and... I will be rolling a D100, uh, which is what you roll most of the time in Call of Cthulhu. And I want to get less than 30. I'm going with Psychology. Oh, not even close. Okay, that's fine. Remember, it's not important to pass everything. It's actually interesting if you fail some of them. Uh, if you roll a success against Drive Auto, go here. If you roll a hard success against Psychology, go to this. If you fail your roll, 194. And that's what I did. 194. Silas opens the engine compartment. I say, <laughs> that sounds like a typo. Eh? Um, Silas opens the engine compartment open and sticks his head inside. The hot metal pops and sizzles. He pokes at various components, then withdraws and wipes his brow, smearing it with dark grease. I ain't sure what's wrong. Might be the oil pressure. Might be something knocked off kilter when we took that spill. Can't do much until the engine cools, neither. And with the light failing, I reckon we'll be here through the night. He wipes his hand on a rag. The shadows from your surroundings are already long and the air is chilly. You feel stiff from the journey and a night in the rickety coach sounds unappealing. Silas sees your dismay. This here is Emberhead, miles from any place. I only come through twice a week, but the folks here are good people. May... May Ledbetter keeps a spare room. She'll look after you. Up that alley, turn right, first house on the left. He scratches his cheek, looks again into the engine compartment, and spits on the ground. Meet me back here at eight in the morning, and we'll see how we stand. How's we stand? To look for May Ledbetter's house, go to this. To ask Silas where he will spend the night, go to this. And to challenge Silas about the breakdown, go to 257. Hmm. I think I'm just, yeah. I don't know anything about cars. <laughs> I don't know anything about um, mechanical engineering or, or anything like that. So I, I'm just going to go Path of Least Resistance. Let's go to May Ledbetter's house. 267. You drag your cases between the sullen buildings. You feel surprisingly weary, considering you had all you have spent all day sitting down. Silas's directions lead you to a modest dwelling with a slate roof. 
A nameplate reads Ledbetter, and underneath a sign in neat copper plate reads Lodging Room. The lane around you is gloomy, but a lamp flickers in the window. A breeze chills your face. You're not about to begin your new life by sleeping in the street. You rap on the weather-beaten door. Go to four. After a moment, you hear footsteps inside the house. A bolt is drawn back, and the wooden door swings open. A figure with loose curls and a rough-looking uh, house dress peers at you. Her gaze takes in your travelling suit and your cases. Her voice has a slight Irish lilt. I won't be trying that. Hello, should I take it as you're looking for a room for the night? You inquire as to her rates, suppressing a grimace. As far as you've seen, the village does not offer you many alternatives. Oh, you'll find them very reasonable, she says. You look tired. I'm May. Come inside and we'll take o we'll talk over a cup of tea. The Ledbetter house feels cramped with a low ceiling and simple fittings. But it is well kept and a cheerful fire uh, crackles in the grate. The aroma of the tea is soothing and the cup warms your fingers. Have you come to Emberhead for the festival? asks May. To explain what happened with Silas and the coach, go to 14. To ask about the festival, go to 21. I want to find out about the festival. Let's see, 21. Well, now, I suppose the festival is, only, is about the only reason folks come to Emberhead. I thought you had maybe, maybe come to study it or take photographs. Well, it's not tomorrow night, but the night after. I suppose it looks very strange to a passerby. May tops up your tea. The spout chinks against your cup. We got the beacon, you see. One night every year, there's a torch-lit procession, and we light the beacon on the cliffs. You've never seen the like of it. They say it keeps the spirit of the village alive for another year. It's a celebration. A celebration. She tails off for a moment and blinks. But you didn't come here to listen to me blather. You must be hungry. I can rustle you up a bit of stew. How would that be? You ask again about her rates, and May names a price so low you accept it without hesitation. The room is small but comfortable, and the stew dark and hearty. After dinner, you have a couple of hours before your usual bedtime. Um, this is actually a nice point about Call of Cthulhu as well. Um, they don't worry too much about specific money issues um, based on your credit rating. And this one didn't even take into account. Um, it's kind of like, without keeping very close track of your money, it just says, yeah, you, you can afford this, it's fine. It's within your spending limit. Um, if you're going crazy, or if you're buying super expensive things, there might be uh, some checks to make, or your credit rating might even go down if you buy something very expensive. To talk to May some more, go to 31. To walk around the town and get your bearings, go to 75. To turn in for an early night, go to 63. It seems a little bit boring to uh, go to bed early, so let's find our bearings. 75. May's brow creases when you announce your intention to take a stroll. Mind how you go, she says. Emberhead surrounded by cliffs and we don't have your fancy street lamps here. Take the lantern and watch your steps. Outside, you see what she means. The sky is overcast and only a few glimmers of moonlight uh, peek from the clouds. Without the heavy lantern, you would be walking in near total darkness. Uh, you cannot hope to get an overview of the village tonight. May's Street is a narrow passage hemmed in by a squat... I'm sorry, hemmed in by squat, dark dwellings. At the end, however, it opens up. A wide thoroughfare leads off to your right. A crude sign names it Silbury Street. To the left, a few yards away, your light picks out um, the crooked posts of a simple fence, and beyond that, the ground drops away into darkness. You take a couple of steps closer, but you can see nothing. Air from below cools your face. Then some instinct makes you look around. 86. An ink-black figure stands in the road, about 20 yards behind you. It stares at you. You form the sudden impression that it will run at you and throw you over the cliff. This is unsettling. Seeing it has been spotted, the figure slips down an alley. To return to the safety of the Ledbetter house, go to 100. To confront the dark figure, go to 121. I want to find out. I gotta know. I gotta know. 121. 
As you approach, the figure takes a pace back, then another. It slips down an alley between two buildings. To catch the target, you must make a track roll, and terrible at track. If you succeed, go to 141. If you fail, go to 130. So let's check out my track. 10%. Well, there's always a chance. Let's go. Oh, 26. Nice and low, but not low enough. Um, there is an option in Call of Cthulhu as well um, that you can spend your luck points, uh, which is great. So, for example, I scored a 26, but I needed a 10. So I could take, um, I use a 16 of my luck points to reduce that score down to a 10. I won't do it now. Usually if it's like one or two points off, it's it's worth using luck. Um, if you fail, go to 130. I failed. The figure moves fast with almost silent steps. You are hampered with a heavy lantern in an unfamiliar environment. You emerge from the alley in a dusty courtyard and can detect no sign of your quarry. You scratch around for a few minutes, but the figure has gone. It seems unwise to continue your stroll through unknown dark streets while this threatening presence is aboard. Abroad. Uh, you head back to the Ledbetter house. May lets you in and settles back in her chair. Soon she begins to yawn. I believe I'll turn in. When would you like your breakfast? 63. As May stands, you hear a clunk behind you. You look over your shoulder, but all you can see is a wooden door, securely closed. May tuts. Tch. The young lady of the house. She'll have been listening to us. Ruth, come and greet our guest. There is a short pause, then the door creaks open. Two wide eyes peer at you from the gap between tousled hair and a rough nightgown. What do you say? The eyes blink. Pleased to meet you. Now get back to bed. Uh, that was a bit harsher than I meant. <laughs> uh, the door closes again. Now get back to bed. The door closes again. My daughter Ruth, ten years this summer. She's a delight and a torment all in one. Don't worry, she sleeps in with me. She'll not disturb you. Good night now. You retire to your room. It is a little chilly, but you are too tired to worry about lighting the fire. Um, the sheets are clean and the bed soon warms up. The silence outside is strange after living in a town for so long, but you soon drop off. 154. You dream of fire in the grate, uh, coruscating colours shimmering through the dancing tongues of flame. At first they are tiny, almost microscopic, but they grow and grow until a, kaleidoscope, a kaleidoscopic inferno spills from the fireplace, spreading across the floor, up the sheets. You wake with a start. Daylight glints through the curtains. You get up and examine the grate, blinking the sleep from your eyes. It is quite cold. If you had taken any damage, uh, if you have taken any damage, you may heal one hit point for your night's sleep. But we didn't take any damage. 166. May seems to have uh, no running water, but has a, supplied some in a ceramic jug. You freshen up at the washstand and go in. She cooks a hearty breakfast and leaves you to eat in peace. Leaves you in peace to eat. At about 7.30, you are paid up, packed and ready to go. You bid May goodbye and she wishes you the best for your new career in Arkham. If you succeeded at a skill roll last night and wish to investigate the result further, go to 178. Otherwise, go 192. Well, I didn't, so 192 it is. You are already tired of your heavy bags. Hopefully Silas has repaired the motor coach and you can resume your long journey. A sourpuss he might be, but the old driver seemed to understand his vehicle well enough. You pause to check your watch, still 20 minutes early, and round the final corner. The motor coach is gone. You put your bags down and search the area, trekking up and down slopes and around corners. At the edge of the village, you trace a long road back as it winds across the hill. Eight o'clock comes and goes. There is no coach to be seen. A passing villager notices your bags. Looking for the bus? I heard him take off a lot, off at first light. He's due back in three or four days. If you need a place to stay, May Ledbetter rents a room. The man raises his hat to you and strolls on into the village. You curse Silas under your breath. Perhaps he went for parts, but you wonder if the old goat has stranded you here on purpose. 2.18 
May is doing laundry and looks surprised to see you again. Forgot something? When you explain the situation, she offers to store your bags while you try to arrange alternative transport. You are grateful to relinquish the load. Nobody here has anything like a car. She strokes her chin and narrows her eyes. Maybe you could find somebody with a horse and a cart for your bags. I could ask around later. Try Mr. Winters at the village hall. He'll know if anyone will. Or ask among the artisans. Their workshops are first left on Silbury Street. She reaches over and squeezes your wrist. Don't worry. I won't see you sleeping in the streets. Money or no money. You thank May and turn to face the village. Go to six. <clears throat> you wander the streets of Emberhead without any particular destination in mind. The village is built on a relatively flat upland with splendid views. To the north, the hazy tips of the white mountains reach for the heavens. To the south, the sparkling waters of Lake Winnis Winnipesaukee. Sorry. Touch the horizon. The village itself takes less than five minutes to cross from edge to edge. You arrived on the winding road to the west. The only other road le leaves to the south, following a lower ridge of land as it turns east. In the southwest of the village, an open grassy space borders a ruined church, its graveyard cresting the cliffs. To the northeast, the three main thoroughfares meet at a raised black metal structure. It looms stark against the blue sky. You may now ask about transport at the local general store, seek out the village hall, walk down to the lower level and check out the eastern road, examine the large metal structure, explore the church, or look for local people with their own transport needs. I think I'll go to the general store. I think that's where she said, if anyone knows, he will. I think. Well, let's see. 16. The general store is on a corner behind the main road, just before it plunges to the south. The shopkeeper is a brisk, immense lady with a starched apron and strong shoulders. She looks hard at your unfamiliar face. Transport? There's a motor coach comes through twice a week. Missed it? Hmm. Truck brings in my supplies every second Tuesday, but he's not due until next week. She shrugs. It seems Emberhead is content to keep its distance from the outside world. You have enough money to buy one or two inexpensive everyday items here. Note them down on your investigator sheet. Remind, uh, remember, the year is 1927. The shop stocks no weapons except a dusty hunting knife, which you may purchase if you want. Sure. Um, I'll get the knife. <laughs> um, so I'll just note down here. Uh, it's a weapon, so it's going to be a knife. Rusty hunting knife. That's fine. Um, we don't know exactly. Now my skill is going to be with um, Fighting Brawl. Counts as that, so it's just going to be 50. And we'll find out about the um, damage later. 25. Uh, is there anything else that I want? Um, no, nothing really comes to mind. 25. You're beginning to get your bearings in Emberhead. Would you like to explore some more? You may choose another option uh, from those below. Do not repeat a previous choice. Once you have tried four options, or before that if you are ready to move on, go to three. Um, ask about transport at the local general store, go to 16. Seek out the village hall, go to 84. Walk down to the lower level and check out the eastern road, go to 115. <coughs> Excuse me. Examine the large metal structure, go to 57. Explore the church, go to 34. Look for local people with their own transport needs at go to 96. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to take a quick note here as well um, of 25. I can come back here. I can check out four things. I'm not sure if that um, includes the one that I just took, number 16. I'm going to say it probably does. So I've already done 16, so I'll leave that. Seek out the village hall. Check out the Eastern Road. So I've got three more things to do. The church. Hmm. I don't think anyone's going to have the transport, so I'm not going to go there. So I've got one, two, three, four. Well, that would make sense, yeah. Um, so I have to choose one more of these not to go to. What do I want to go to first? 
Um, examine the large metal structure. No, I'm gonna go to the church first. So I'm gonna go 30, 34, just to keep track of it. 34. You cross the street towards the church. As you glance to your left, your gaze alights on the large metal structure. Something bothers you about its positioning. You back up and look again. Yes, Emberhead's central thoroughfare points directly at the structure. Uh, this seems too precise to be a coincidence. You press on and draw into the shadow of the church. The building is in a sorry state. The top of the steeple is missing. A ragged gash of splintered boards marking its absence, um, and the floors beneath it have collapsed. It appears to have torn through the roof of the main building as it fell. Only the black half, is, oh, I'm sorry, only the back half is still intact. The white paint, which once covered the church, has yellowed and peeled. It seems safe enough to explore the rear section. Old pews are stacked against the walls, choked with mildew. Most of the windows are broken. You guess this church has been disused for about 20 years. There's little more interest to you. Oh, so this is the focal point around which the whole thing is built. Uh, the whole town is built, but it is broken and unused. Make a ride roll. You may have a bonus die. Uh, roll the ten. Ah, this is the bonus and penalty. Uh, you may have a bonus die. Roll the tens percentage die twice and take the lower result. If you succeed, go to 46. Otherwise, go to 25. So ride is usually on uh, horseback or something like that. So I think I have very little here. Uh, five percent, five percent chance. Okay, that's fine. Um, so let's check this out. Ah, why did I? Okay, so this is going to be my tens and my other one. So a normal roll, and this would this is my first roll is like this. Ten and seven. Oh, so that's a seven. Ah. So obviously I can't get a score of a one hundred and seven. This would be a a zero and a seven. So a score of seven, and I needed a five or less. That's incredible. Um, so if you have a bonus die, it means this tens die gets rolled again. Um, if you're using the uh, physical dice that come with it, uh, um, usually you roll um, the blue is your bonus die. Um, and so then looking at the two tens die, if you have a bonus, you take the lower one, which is better for you. Uh, and if you have a penalty, you would take the higher one, which is worse for you. So actually, I can't get any better than zero. The seven stays the same. Um, I can't get any better than zero, but I'll roll it again anyway. The step, seven will stay the same, but just for the sake of rolling it. Uh, three. So I got a seven and a 37. And as it was a bonus, I take the lower, the seven. Ah. Um, so I could... I'm not sure if it's in the rules for the starter set, um, but I think I'm going to do it because that was such a great roll. I'm going to use two luck points, bring this down to 53, <coughs> which brings my 7 down to a 5, which makes it a success. Um, if you succeed, go to 46. The interior smells of earth and decay, but you catch an additional distinctive whiff about the place, the scent of horses. You search around and in a dark corner find the, uh, both the remnants of a hoof mark and some dried droppings. The church, the ruined church was used as a stable and quite recently. Where are the horses now? Ooh. And so this is going to bring me back to 25. So check out the church. Ooh. Do, 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 do. I'm going to go 57. I want to see about that large metal structure. Uh, 57. Uh, you walk up the approach, the most central of the village's major streets. It points directly at the odd metal structure. As you emerge from the shade of the nearby buildings, you are greeted by a magnificent panorama spread from the north to the southeast. The last colours of fall tint the hills in a sleepy gold. The structure, by contrast, is made from uncompromising iron, singed black. It supports an immense curved platform at the level of your head. 
Further struts snake up to a central point. It looks uh, like they may have been some kind of sculpture at one time, but are now twisted and melted beyond recognition. An older gentleman passes, looking up at you uh, with roomy eyes. Are you here for the festival? he asks. That's the beacon. When they light it, night after next, you'll be able to see it ten miles away. He gives a little nod of satisfaction, then moves on, leaning on his walking stick. Now you notice the bundles of wood tied and stacked against the buildings nearby. Perhaps the festival will be an interesting diversion, but you really must head to Arkham as soon as possible. Make a spot hidden roll. If you succeed, go to 69, otherwise go to 25. Did I? I didn't put anything in spot hidden, did I? Oh, spot hidden is a, is a good one to have. Um, let's have a quick look. So 25 or less. 75, not even close. That's fine. So I will be going back for my last one. Ooh. Uh, seek out the village hall or check out the eastern road. Ah, uh, maybe there's a way out. So I'll go 115. Just mark it here. Oops. 115. The air is fresh and the walk down to the lower ridge invigorating. You notice cultivated fields stretching through the lowlands around Amberhead, and among the crops some livestock, but no horses. Are you going to have to make your uh, onward journey on foot? Further down, the road skirts the edge of the ridge and descends. There are a few scattered hovels here with signs of habitation. They are set a substantial distance apart. As you examine them, a door opens and an older man steps out. He wears a bedraggled suit, but carries a piece of cloth, which he tosses over his head like a hood. As he does this, he sees you and freezes. Make a luck roll. If you succeed, turn to 127. So um, your luck is, usually when you're making a roll, it's usually in the um, skills down here, but sometimes it uses your characteristics, especially luck. So previously, I used two points of luck. So now my uh, chances of succeeding in luck have decreased. So that's the trade-off there. So I want to score 53 or lower. Oh! Ah! If I hadn't spent the luck earlier to find out about the horses in the, uh, in the church, I would have passed it. Um, you can't use luck to... Uh, succeed on a luck roll to change a luck roll um, which I think makes sense so I failed turn to 135 so I imagine my luck roll no I, I don't know well let's see what happens actually because he's definitely seen me the strange man breaks into a run fleeing from you along the ridge his gait is lopsided but his movements have a manacle intensity if you give chase turn to 150 Maybe this is the guy who uh, was following me last night. Um, okay, I'm going to chase him. 150. And chases are actually very good in Call of Cthulhu as well. I'm not sure if they'll do a full one here. but uh, You break from the road and pursue the man, feeling a uh, wild grass snatch at your feet. He sprints around the ridge, attempting to elude you behind the very rocks that support the metal structure high above. To catch the man, you must make an opposed roll with your dex versus his. The man has dex 38. He scores a hard success on a roll of 19 and under, an extreme success on a roll of 7 and under. Make the man's dex roll, then make your dex roll. So, he has a score of 38. So, let's roll for him. His dex score is 47. So, uh, the number is actually not so important. It just shows that he failed. Um, and let's roll mine. So my dex is 80. Yes, I've got good dexterity. So uh, basically all I want to do is get under 80 and I'll be fine. Close, but yes, I got under 80. So in this case, I scored, uh, my roll was much higher, as in worse, but because my dexterity is better, it worked out better. His one was a fail and my one was a success. So let's have a look at what it explains here. Compare your level of success. Um, so an extreme success, which is 
if I had scored 16 or under, beats a hard success. A hard success beats a regular success, and a regular success beats a failure. Ah, uh, which is it? An extreme success beats a hard success, which beats a regular normal success, which beats a failure. If there's a draw, the higher skill value wins. So um, I uh, passed and he failed. I had a success and he had a failure. So I win this, 172. <coughs> you draw close to the man. He glares over his shoulder and sees you. Damn you, he spits and slows down. Can't you leave a fella be? You assure him you mean him no harm. We can't talk here, he says. Follow me. 142. 142. You follow the man around the outcrop. He glances up, then steps between two rocks and vanishes. Closer inspection reveals a narrow channel leading into the cliff. There is just enough light to see a small, natural chamber within. You will be uncomfortably close to this man if you go inside. To follow him in, turn to 191. To keep your distance, 160. Gotta go for it, you know, risk it all. Um, my friend Richard back home had a great phrase for, I believe it came from risk. Uh, if in doubt, risk it all. Um, so, 191. With wary steps, you squeeze between rocky outcrops and enter the concealed chamber, almost banging your head on the low ceiling. The man settles back against the wall and watches you until, and watches until you draw close. Then he slides back his hood. Make a sanity roll. If you fail, lose one sanity. Then go to 199. Ah, so I'll make a sanity roll. So let's look at our sanity score. 50 is not so great. Well, 50-50 chance. So I have to roll under 50. 50 or under. 73. Okay. So what happened here is I failed it. So it says uh, lose one sanity. So my current sanity will go down to 49. Um, and that's fine. Then go to 199. Some of the man's face remains. A strip from the side of his jaw to the right eye socket is healthy and pale, if aged. But the left side is consumed by angry scar tissue. One eye droops, uh, hooded by melted flesh, and the nostril on that side is pulled open to leave a gaping hole. The disfigured man studies your reaction with his one good eye. Name's Arbogast. William Arbogast. Guess I don't need to ask what brings you to Emberhead. If you claim to have come for the festival, go to 206. If you admit that Silas has stranded you here, go to 214. I think I'm going to be... Am I going to be honest? I'm going to be honest. 214. The swollen mouth gives a little twist downwards. Son of a devil has rat's blood. His fingers tighten into a fist. Mm -hmm. Two, two, one. Arbogast fixes you with a lopsided yet intense stare. You seek me out, eh? He looks up at the cave ceiling. Which one of them told you about me? Never mind. It doesn't matter. Truth is, they fear what I know. They'd never come at me direct. Don't want to end up like old Arbogast. He giggles. The high-pitched sound is all the more grotesque coming from those bloated lips. Then abruptly, his gaze turns to iron. Emberhead died forty years ago, shattered by flame, consumed by the stars themselves. The ancient hill was cleansed by inferno, and from the blackened ground came new life, as is the way of all things. The Abenaki knew. Abogast wipes his nose on his sleeve. Except none of that happened. The flames were turned away. The necessary death postponed a year, and a year again. And now those up there, he stabs a scrawny finger at the ceiling, think themselves saviors of the world. Think they can defy the great old ones. Yeah, Kuthuga. He shakes his head. With, their strange eon uh, with strange eons, their lives matter less than the blink of an eye. A fierce intelligence burns in his gaze but you suspect Arbogast might, may be quite insane. Should his mood change, it would not be difficult for him to seize one of the loose rocks and crack your skull with it. 
To ask Arbogast about the Abenaki, turn to 227. To ask him about the Great Old Ones, turn to 237. To ask him about the Villagers, turn to 245. To leave while you still can, go to 253. Oh, wow. Mm. Um, I'm going to ask about Abenaki. 227. The Abenaki, he frowns. They knew this land and cherished it. They lived here in harmony for their allotted time. Air and earth, water and fire. They accepted every daybreak as a gift, and they trod lightly on the land. Yet we came and we ended them. Their time is past. Now ours, too, must end. Arbogast runs a hand through his hair. A wide strip is missing on the left side, displaced by scar tissue. He climbs to his feet, 259. Arbogast pauses in the shadows. There's something about you, something the previous ones never had. Perhaps you can make it through. If you want to hear more, meet me again after dark. Nine o'clock. The graveyard on the other side. He lifts a gnarled finger. Don't be followed, else I won't be there. This ain't the time of year for a showdown. Arbogast wipes his nose on his sleeve again. Go now. Their eyes are on me. And stranger, don't try to run. You'll never make it. You emerge into the sunlight, blinking, and more than a little shaken. You have discovered a secret. Later tonight, the text will offer you a chance to follow up on a previous appointment. At that point, if you want to meet with Arbogast again, add 20 to your current entry number and go to that new entry. For now, go to 160. So this is uh, how they manage like secrets in um, Choose Your Own Adventure. Sometimes you get a secret code um, to meet. So I'm just taking a quick memo of that. Arbogast. It's a great name. Um, add 20 to current location when prompted. So later it will say, if you have an arrangement to meet someone, go to that entry. So um, but that'll, that'll come up later. For now, go to 160. I wrote that down, yeah. 160. You turn back to the road and your core business, getting out of Emberhead and onward to Ossipi. The ridge gives you a good viewpoint from which you can see the course of the road. It winds with the hills, disappearing into the woodland for a while before emerging further on. You lose sight of it for a while, uh, sorry, you lose sight of it somewhere towards a second patch of woodland. By your best estimation, this is at least six or seven miles distant. You see no other settlements or traffic. It may be worth taking a chance and walking. The weather is still mild, but you will need supplies before you attempt it. Go to 25. Okay, so that's the end of my... I've now done three plus my original one, so I'm going to count that as four. Um, once you have tried four options, I go to three. Your morning exertions have left you hungry. You roam the streets of Emberhead looking for sustenance. There is nothing resembling the busy cafes of your hometown, or anything that might be called a restaurant. It is beginning to look like you will have to get supplies from the general store, when May Ledbetter uh, comes down the street with a girl trailing in her wake. This must be Ruth. As she notices you, she races past her mother and approaches you with a smile. This is a different Ruth from the shy creature of last night. As she reaches you, she stops and stretches her arms up in celebration. She looks up in your eyes. Abruptly, the smile drops from her face, and she looks several years older. Get out before the festival, she hisses. Get out! She blinks hard, then scuttles back towards her mother. May approaches you, wrapping an arm around her daughter's shoulder. She smiles. How are you getting on? Have you found transport? Startled, you explain the frustrations of the situation. I try Mr. Winters in the village hall. He's always in in of a, an afternoon. You'll be hungry by now. Help yourself to any food in the house. The door's not locked. You glance at Ruth, where she has squirreled herself behind her mother's leg. Her eyes implore you to silence. If you ask Ruth about what she said, go to nine. If you ask May about what Ruth said, go to fifteen. <coughs> if you say nothing, go to twenty-two. I think I can't. I can't put her in trouble, but... Arbogast told me to get out, uh, not to run. And now Ruth is telling me, run. Okay, 22, I won't say anything. 
you take your leave of the Ledbetters and head towards the house. The door opens easily. In the low kitchen you make a meal from a stodgy bread and leftover stew. A little window offers a view to the mountains. If you learned one thing this morning, it was that Emberhead Street hold little to occupy the visitor from out of town, but there are still about five hours of daylight remaining. You could take some provisions and the bare essentials from your luggage, and set out in the hope of reaching another settlement um, before dark. Or you could ask, um, uh, or you could ask advice from this Mister Winters. So that is the one thing that I. Mm, Okay, let's talk to Mr. Winters. There's still five hours of daylight remaining. Okay, so let's check number 11. The village hall overlooks the lower north side of the north ridge of the village. You walk along Silbury Street to find it, conscious of the oppressive black metal structure framed at the end of the road. The shutters of the hall are open and some windows left ajar. There is no knocker, but a little bell over the entrance tinkles. Uh, as you push the door, uh, push the front door. Inside, a sturdy door to your right is marked private. To your left, an opening leads through a, through a bright room. You take a few steps inside. Benches line the walls, and there are two notice boards mounted between the windows. To examine the notice boards, go to 17. To knock on the closed door, go to 24. 24, because I'm looking for Mr. Winters. You raise a hand, I uh, raise your hand to knock on the door, but it opens before you can complete the movement. The middle-aged gentleman behind it takes an involuntary step back, adjusting his spectacles. You hasten to apologize and introduce yourself. He steadies himself and uh, peers at you. I see. I'm Clyde Winters. Just visiting, you say, and you've come to see me. Hmm. Care for some coffee? I usually take a cup around this time of the afternoon. <coughs> His invitation seems genuine enough and a good opportunity to ask any questions that are on your mind. Go to 43. You step through the door marked private. The other side of the village hall is in marked contrast to the public space. The room is compact, lined with shelves of books and file alcoves. One corner is reserved for a tiny pantry and what is presumably a water closet. You study Mr. Winters as he, files, as he fills the percolator. Although thin on top, his hair is oiled and neatly swept back. His suit is a sober affair, and well tailored, even if it is cut, uh, even if the cut is a little old-fashioned. A lesser man working alone might have loosened his bow tie for comfort. On the desk against the opposite wall, you notice what looks like a telegraph set. To ask about the telegraph, uh, immediately go to 46. To make small talk with him first, go to 49. Ooh... <sighs> Definitely want to ask about the telegraph, but maybe it's good to talk to him first. Grease the wheels. Grease the wheels. 49. The pot begins to gurgle as you exchange pleasantries with Winters. Living here? It's a trade-off, like so much in life. He looks past you at a high shelf. I could wish for access to a proper library, of course, but I know myself well enough. I'm strictly a dabbler. And the cities? His face wrinkles in distaste. Too many people. Everybody rushing and shouting. We have a special place here in Emberhead, and someone must accept responsibility for keeping it so. That was my father before me, and now the duty falls to me. He lifts his chin and straightens up. This evening, as the sun sets, look out at the landscape around the village. We have peace up here, halfway to the stars. Are we not privileged? Is this not worth the hardships that we must accept? He looks at you speculatively. This seems a good time to ask about the telegraph. Great. 56. The telegraph? Hmm. Much as we value our isolation, we do need the link sometimes. You were hoping to send a message? I must apologize. The line has been down for two weeks. I reported the fault, but of course they're not so speedy with the problem uh, when the problem lies in a rural area. I'm expecting a repair the next day, the day after next. I do appreciate how frustrating this must be. The coach is due in, what, three days? But I think he's going west. Perhaps he might engage a wagon. One of the farmers might. You explain that you have asked a few of the residents already, but to no avail. I tell you what. Winter pours you a steaming cup of coffee. The dark liquid smells rich and strong. When the repair crew arrive, I'll ask them to take you back with them. How would that be? 
They might want a dollar or two to grease the wheels. The day after tomorrow? It's less than ideal, but it's the first real opportunity you've had. Gonna ask about the library. 62. You make a small but flattering remark about a couple of the volumes of uh, on his shelves. Winters blushes with pleasure. Well, of course, they're not my personal collection. They belong to the village. But I did select most of the recent items. This is the community library, you see. I put up the private sign to stop people just wandering in from meetings uh, in the other room. But this is really a public space. You scan the shelves. There is a sparse but respectable collection on mathematics and the sciences, passable sections uh, on history and art, and a shelf on literature. He has a few lowbrow novels tucked away in a corner with a tidy copy of Bizarre Tales magazine. Quality does not always equate to popularity, I'm afraid. Winters gives you an apologetic smile. Take the time to, uh, for some research in the library, go to 68. To leave while it's still light outside, go to 180. I'm a professor. 68. Winters is happy for you to spend the rest of the afternoon in study and offers you an upright but comfortable chair. You have enough time to pursue one line of research in depth. To read about the history of the area, to read about the festival, to read something from the sciences, to read something of weird fiction. 81. I want to find out about this festival. 81. You are not surprised to find that it is no published work. Uh, there is no published work on Emberhead's festival. Winters pokes around and finds a case uh, monograph handwritten on yellowing paper by Dr. Anielowski. An acquaintance of my father, I believe, Winter says. The manuscript is somewhat difficult to read and you make slow progress. Anielowski speculates that the festival had its origin in pagan rites brought over by Celtic settlers. Uh, Celtic settlers, I'm sorry, uh, which celebrate the ancient festivals of Beltane, Samhain, Imbolc, and Lunasa. Um, in Irish, uh, this would be Bialtana, Samhain, Imbolc, and Lunasa. Uh, there is some discussion on the struggle between the seasons and a couple of oblique references to the alignment in Emberhead. Anielowski suggests that the meaning of the festival slowly changed around the turn of the century. The monograph terminates mid-sentence at the end of the page of page 28, just as it begins to discuss the modern practices. You ask Winters if he has the remaining pages. No, I'm afraid those have been misplaced, he says. Perhaps they are in the, still in the library somewhere, but... He shrugs. I must make time for a thorough stock take. Now go to 99. <coughs> The afternoon wears on. You have not quite finished your reading when Winters glances out the window and stands up. He clears his throat. Make a credit rating roll. Okay. My credit rating is 30. So let's see. How does it go? Come on, low score. Oh, 61. And again, don't worry about uh, passing or failing. That's absolutely not the main uh, thing here. Uh, so I failed this. 105. Nice bear. I'm afraid I have some errands to run before dark, so I must close the library for today. I do hope you will return tomorrow afternoon if you are so inclined. You leave the building with Winters, waiting as he locks up. You thank him for the coffee and access, and access to the library. He disappears off down an alley. You hope to be away from the village by, uh, before tomorrow afternoon, but it's good to know that there's a place you can occupy yourself. Now go to 180. So presumably, if... I had passed the credit rating, I would have been able to stay in the library. He would have trusted me to lock up if I looked like a wealthy um, and high-class person. But I don't. Okay, 180. As the light fades, you return to the Ledbetter house and eat a light supper. May is unusually taciturn. Ruth's eyes flick to yours several times during the meal. There is an urgency there uh, you cannot quite interpret. Afterwards, May ushers the girl into their room. You've been in Emberhead for barely one whole day, and you've already, you already feel confined by it, both geographically and socially. The evening seems to offer little. To do some stargazing, uh, go to 131. To attempt to speak to Ruth, go to 138. If you have a previous appointment, this is the time to follow it up. So this is what I mentioned before. Um, oh, I'm sorry, it's in my notes here. Uh, to meet Arbogast at 20 to your current location when prompted. So <clears throat> I was on 180, so I need to go to 200. 
Arbogast is not at the appointed meeting place. You give him ten minutes, but he doesn't show. You curse the old crank and head back towards May's house. Psst! A hand snakes from a doorway and grabs your arm. You jump at the sight of that half-face glimpsed in starlight. One of them's near, he whispers. Watching. Come with me. Go to 169. Arbogast leads you through the thoroughfare, slipping between the houses. The metal structure looms at the end of the street. Silent now, he says, but the beacon will come alive tomorrow night. He ushers you into a little alcove behind the village school. Arbogast glances behind you, then sits down. Again you feel uncomfortable in proximity to the scarred visage. One melted eyelid lifts. You don't have long. Understand this. I was the conduit, the interpreter, before that fool winters and his fancy word. The things which come to Amberhead care not for words. Those idiots think this is a ritual of sacrifice. He spits on the grass. It's a ritual of control. They know the words, but they do not comprehend the forces they call. He sniffs and sits back. No, you have no time for more questions. I will teach you how to end it uh, in the moment when all is lost. You can return this hill to the earth, to the death that came forty years ago. I have tried it myself, but... His head sags. I no longer have the concentration. The chant is simple. It I can teach you, but you must perform it with a clarity of mind that I have lacked for years. If you will learn this strange chant, go to 175. If you have had enough of Arbogast, go to 182. Do I trust Arbogast? Yes. Maybe yes. 175. Let's learn our ritual. You feel uh, very dislocated. I'm sorry. You feel very dislocated from reality as you sit on top on a cliff top behind a school at night, learning a chant by rote from a madman. Arbogast is careful to teach you it in sections. He glances into the sky. Won't work right now. Cloud covering the star, but he still takes care not to pronounce the whole thing at once. It has a rhythmic beginning and various elaborations. But the core passage is repeated three times. In time, Arbogast listens to your recital and nods. Remember every sound, but never speak it if you have plans left on this earth. You have discovered a secret. If your situation ever becomes desperate enough to try Arbogast's ritual, the text will offer you the option to chant. At that point, if you want to try it, add 10 to your current uh, entry number and go to that new entry. So I'll just take a quick note of that. Um, to chant Arbogast's ritual, add 10 to current entry. Okay. Arbogast leans back. It'll make you one with the living. One with the living. Looks like maybe he gets cut off. 188. A black shape lunges from the dark. It wraps an arm around Arbogast's throat and drags him backward out of the alcove. He grabs at the arm, kicking empty air. You see the gleam of a long blade in the moonlight. Make a dodge roll. If you succeed, go to 195. If you fail, go to 203. I think my dodge is 60. Half of my dexterity, plus I added 20 to it. So, nice. 60. Let's see. Can I get out of here? Can I get out of the way? 84. Wow, my rolls are bad. So, yeah, I failed that. That's fine. Um, if you fail, go to 203. Um, something smashes you on the temple. You reel back. You hear Arbogast yell and see the knife flash. One, two, three times. Its shiny surface darkening with blood. Something strikes you again and you sink. And as you sink, flames leap from the ground, painting the night with infernal colour. Uh, they pick out three dark figures. Take 1d6 damage. Go to 45. So, um, earlier it said if you take damage you can heal it by resting. But healing is very slow. So I'm going to click it and then I'm going to roll it. That's always how I do it. This one doesn't count. Oh, thank God. And this one does count four okay not great um that's fine so i'm going to go down to five hit points go to 45 do they do major wounds in this 
No, okay, that's fine. That's one of the advanced rules, but it, it doesn't count here anyway. Go to 45. You awake with a jolt, wrestling the blankets, ready for attack. The Ledbetter guest room is quiet, painted with morning light. There is nobody here but you. You release the blankets and wait for your heart to stop hammering. So I made it back. 64. The Ledbetter kitchen is empty, although bread and eggs have been laid out for your breakfast. There is a note from May explaining that she has taken Ruth out for a few hours. If you are involved in a fight in the village last night and want to investigate the aftermath, go to 70. Otherwise, go to 78. <sighs> Arbogast is dead. It's probably best not to look into it. 78. You make a quiet circuit of the village, pausing in an unobtrusive place to watch the villagers. It is rather busy for this time in the morning. Yawning locals stream back and forward along the roads. I probably should have checked on Arbogast. Anyway, uh, carrying bundles of split logs to the site of what you have, you've you heard referred to as the beacon. You see two figures already up in the superstructure, arranging the wood. The festival bonfire will be m most impressive. But you do you intend to stay to see it? You suspect by now that something is amiss here. While the villagers are distracted, you may do some illicit investigation, or you may simply leave town without looking back. So Ruth said, run, get out of here. Arbogast said they'll never let you leave. I imagine after last night, they're definitely not going to let me leave. Go alone to the village hall. I could look through those things. I think I'm going to check out the um, May Ledbetters. Maybe Ruth has something for me. 83. Despite her hospitality, you do not trust May Ledbetter. You return to her house quite openly. Where else would you go? Inside, the dwelling is still empty. You rap on the bedroom door and wait. Silence. You ease it open. The Ledbetter bedroom is in, a, in marked contrast to your own neat space. Dirty clothes are piled about the floor. On a rough quilt lie school books and cheap novels. You notice a raggedy old doll discarded down the side of the bed. To make a spot hi uh, make a spot hidden roll. My spot hidden? Not so good, only twenty five. But my rolls have been bad recently. Hopefully I'll get some luck. So again these don't count. This one counts. Ah uh, nope. Wow, I'm bad. Eighty nine, okay. You go through Ledbetter's drawers. The only item of interest you find is a wedding photograph. May's husband was a wiry man with a square chin. Despite the formality of the pose, you can see the affection between them. You feel a pang of guilt at your intrusion. Also, May might return at any time. If you wish to push the spot hidden roll, make the roll again. If you succeed, uh, go to 95. If you fail, go to 101. So what happens with uh, pushing a roll means you say something that you're taking extra effort to look for it. Um, but usually there can be more negative consequences if you fail. And uh, now the chances of me failing, and it's just a normal roll, so if if I had to get a regular success in the push roll, I also have to get a regular success. So there's only a one in four chance of me getting the passing it. So it's a bad choice. And I'd probably piss off me. But I want to know. So I'm going to go... Um, Usually in a game, like in a choose-your-own-adventure, it's fine, but in an actual game of Call of Cthulhu, you would have to justify um, how you are pushing the roll, how you are making an extra effort. So I'm going to um, kind of check the closets, check the floor. Is there anything loose there? Any secret compartments? Come on, under 25. <laughs> Not even close. Okay, so usually there's some negative consequence. In a... Um, uh, in an actual game, a uh, face-to-face uh, with not a solo game, uh, usually the GM or the keeper will let you know what potential negative consequences might come up. Uh, but I failed, 101, and here a shadow falls across to you. So, May Ledbetter says, you know. You try to get to your feet. A mob of villagers spill from behind her and surrounds you. You struggle, but you cannot resist the sheer weight of their numbers. You are quickly overpowered. Wow. I didn't think it would turn out that badly. 108. Okay. 
Uh, the fading light from a narrow window tells you afternoon is giving way to evening. Your hands are shackled behind your back so you cannot even lie down on the rough bed. A woman you have not seen before comes in. Her face is wrinkled and her eyes dull. They do not meet yours, but she puts a cup to your lips. Oh, to accept the drink or to reject it. I shouldn't take it, right? I shouldn't take it. I'm going to go one, one, three. You turn your face away, and when she tries again, you dash the cup from her hands using the side of your head. The clear liquid spills across the floor. The woman gives a half shrug and turns to leave the room. You shout after her, but she gives no reaction. <laughs> you soon become thirsty. Is it just water? <laughs> it's just water. <laughs> That's good. Uh, 205. Um... As the light fades outside, your little prison becomes dark. You can hear much activity around the building. Occasionally, an orange glow passes the window. The only comfortable position in the shackles seems to be to sit against the end of the bed, with your arms hanging behind you. You need to concentrate and come up with a plan. There is clearly no escape from your bonds. <clears throat> you do not know exactly what your captors want from you, but you cannot ignore the fact that they have spent the entire day constructing a massive bonfire. 27. Well, you know what we're getting uh, hints of here anyway. The door scrapes, uh, wrenching you back into the moment. Orange light spills into the house from the blazing torches held at the threshold. Two large villagers step in and grab you. At least, you assume they are villagers. They wear heavy black cloaks and their faces and hands are painted entirely black, save only for a red triangle centred on their left eye. Ooh. You try to drag your legs, but they reach under your arms and lift you bodily from the bed. Outside, it seems that the whole village has congregated to see you. Every single one has a blackened face with a red triangle motif. Torches sputter and spill fire. You struggle, but you uh, can see the physical resistance is hopeless. You are marched to the central street and turned to face the beacon. One one's up. The, pr the procession down the approach is slow and formal, save when you sense weakness and yank at your captors. A chill, touch a chill touches you when you see three human shapes carried ahead of you, draped in red cloth. The beacon looms larger and larger, its dreadful silhouette, a black triangle pointing to the stars. A low drone begins among the cloaked figures. Unbidden, the word... Mourners comes to mind. Smoke from the tor their torches makes you cough. You feel heat on your face. As you reach the cleared area around the beacon, three dancers break from the pack, young girls swinging balls of fire in spe spectacular arcs, drawing circles in the night air. One by one, they draw close to you and touch your forehead with sooty fingers. Each kisses you three times, on the left cheek, right cheek, then forehead. Then they whisper in your ear. The smell of kerosene fills your nostrils. Make an appearance roll. Mm. What is my appearance? Um, oh, not bad. 60. Can I? I've been failing a lot recently. <laughs> 61! Okay, well, I'm going to push. Or not, not push it. I'm going to use my luck for that. Because uh, I've been failing so much recently. I just want to you know, succeed something. Um... If you succeed, go to 10. Oh. Okay, well, that's just a small mistake there, uh, which is useful when you um, say out loud what number you're going to go to, or if you keep a track. Um, so number 10 it was. Through your sacrifice, the village will be reborn, says the first answer. You pass from earth to air for all our sakes, said the second. I've weakened the chain, says the third. Don't try to escape until the flames are high enough to hide you. You stare at the third dancer. In that inky visage, you clearly see, you clearly discern the frightened features of Ruth Ledbetter. Their dance weaves off and disappears behind the village, uh, behind the buildings. Go to eighteen. 
As you arrive beneath the beacon, ten villagers close in on you. Uh, working with surprising coordination, they immobilize you and lift you up, uh, lift you up the blackened iron stairs to the raised platform. You cannot help but shiver at the sight of the central framework twisted from past blazes, and what you can now clearly see to be fastening points for the chain. None of the eyes meet yours as they lash you to the metal. The village sings now, something rhythmic and ancient, carved from odd syllables. A second group ascends to the beacon, carrying the three red draped bodies. With reverence they arrange their burdens in a triangle around your feet. Then they withdraw leaving you alone with the dead, shin-deep in a sea of kindling. Go to 33. It seems the entire village is gathered around the beacon to watch you burn. Behind the face paint you recognize May Ledbetter, and yes, that is Silas, the coach driver, standing at her side. The audacity and scale of the de deception staggers you. A man steps up on a dais and raises his hands with quiet authority. The frame of his spectacles obscures the red triangle on his face. So we draw here together again on this night, as we do each year, and we give thanks to the one who will preserve the village against the fire of the void. You will be taken by the ones from above in our stead. Your death will bring life to our streets and bounty to our fields. It will safeguard our children and our elders alike for another year. We salute you, he bows his head. All around the beacon, bearers step forward and lift their torches to the edge of the raised platform. A ring of tiny flames flicker up around the perimeter. As they wink, the singing of the villagers drops into an unearthly rhythm. To throw all your remaining strength against the bonds, go to 44. To wait and see what happens, go to 40. Ah, it's a tough one. So, obviously I want to break free. Uh, Ruth says she loosened my bonds, but I have to wait. Do I trust Ruth? Maybe. I think so. I'm going to wait. 40. The flames snake across the kindling, catching and rising. Smoke rises and it uh, becomes difficult to see the villagers. The three bodies surrounding you catch fire, blazing with sooty red flames. You begin to cough as the smoke enters your lungs and fight down the urge to panic. <coughs> if you have learned a strange chant and wish to try it, this is the moment. Otherwise, go to 65. Oh, I think if I do the chant, I'm going to die. But I got I to gotta try it. Maybe if I wait to 65, there's a chance to get out. I'm not sure. I'm going to go to 50, because add 10 for the chant. The flames draw closer as you bring Arbogast's chant to mind. It is hard to clear your head as the heat grows beneath your feet. You cough and splutter, but you sustain the words. Finally, you reach the key passage, and even as your clothes catch fire, you yell for the third time, Nglui Mungla Naf Kthuga Fomal Hauth Nagaga Naf Lathaya Kthuga. Go to 270. The swirling tongues of fire around you stop in midair. The people around the beacon freeze, their black painted faces bleached and stripped, as a second sun opens in the air above Emberhead. In an instant, the people, the village, the hill, all are consumed, incinerated by impossible proximity to sheer combustion, the essence of fire. Though your body is bound to the beacon, your being is freed. As a spark, you race into, the sp into space, catapulted through the vastness of the void. The stars burn uh, past you with incomprehensible velocity, and then you are home. Forever you will dwell here at Fomalhaw, Formal, where the flames ripple and flow through immense spaces to the rhythms of the universe, where plants themselves move and tilt through unutterable wheels of fire, bound to the clockwork chaos, chaos of the living flame. And among the flames you will dance. You have single-handedly destroyed a section of the New Hampshire, of New Hampshire about 16 miles in diameter. This also killed you. The end. 
Okay, so that was one of my playthroughs of Alone Against the Flames. Um, it didn't end particularly well for my character, but that is not the point of Call of Cthulhu. The most important thing is to have an enjoyable adventure, and I certainly enjoyed playing through it. And I discovered some unique points I hadn't encountered before in my previous playthroughs. Um, when I played through it the first time, I really saw this town as just a sidetrack, and I was focused on making it to Arkham. Uh, I was completely blindsided by everything that happened in the town. Um, of course, it has some real Wicker Man vibes, uh, the original, uh, but it's more than different enough to hold up well on its own. If you enjoyed Alone Against the Flames, you might want to check out Alone Against the Tide, Alone Against the Frost, and Alone Against the Dark. Uh, I will have videos coming up about all of them, along with playthroughs. Um, they are similar solo adventures, but whereas Alone Against the Flames was meant to teach you the rules of Call of Cthulhu, um, the other Alone Against uh, games are more standalone. Um, if you are moving straight from Alone Against the Flames, I would recommend maybe Alone Against the Tide or Alone Against the Frost. Alone Against the Dark is actually my personal favorite, but it's a little bit more in-depth as well. So it might be easier to go Alone Against the Flames, and then Alone Against the Tide, Alone Against the Frost, and finally Alone Against the Dark. But how about you? How did your playthrough go? Did you do better than me, or worse? Uh, let me know about your experiences in the comments, and that is all for now, and I'll see you in the next video.